After a lengthy introduction to this message, I will be turning to Matthew chapter 21 before we look at several other texts as well. Today, um, I'm addressing a very controversial topic to correctly define the biblical relationship between Old Testament Israel and the New Testament church. And uh, this subject is every bit as controversial, actually, as our conflicting positions on eschatology and sovereign election versus free will. And it's also somewhat tied to both of those topics, especially eschatology. But today's message was in large part driven or inspired by a question I received this past week by email from a dear friend of mine who attends a church out west. Uh, the question was in reference to Brother Jade's recent series of messages from Deuteronomy 13, wherein Jade stated that Old Testament Israel serves biblically as a type or a figure of the New Testament church, which position Jade repeats often because I agree with it, uh, because in the way he has expressed it, based on a proper definition of the New Testament church, it is biblical. And so the, the email I got this week stated as follows. I was able to meet with my local pastor this evening to discuss some things. I asked, have you ever heard it said the nation of Israel is a foreshadowing of the church? Very sadly, this pastor's rather ignorant and unstudied response was to simply say that the very notion that Old Testament Israel is a foreshadowing or a figure of the New Testament church is strictly an anti-Semitic doctrine. <laughs> anti-Semitic doctrine. I'm sure our friend doesn't want to rock the boat too much with that pastor, but personally, I may have asked man to please explain to me, help me understand how that doctrine is in any way at all anti-Semitic. Yeah. I wish that pastor and many others like him would listen to the message we posted recently on Israel versus Palestine, anti-Semitic versus anti-truth. So I highly doubt that he would do that, considering the unteachable, prideful stubbornness that seems to characterize most Baptist preachers these days. That blinds them to the truth. But this underscores the horrible plight that so many Christians are in these days when the only King James Bible teaching churches they can find are pastored by men who don't study the Bible for themselves. They rely on the simplistic formula of doctrine that they got in Bible college that they think qualifies them to pastor. And for the most part, they have been completely brainwashed by the hyper-dispensational heresies found in the study notes of the Schofield Reference Bible, which, by the way, is precisely where this pastor's canned knee-jerk response came from. That's the main source, and we all come back to that. It's true that historically, there have, in fact, been many who held to the Roman Catholic doctrine of supersessionism or replacement theology that have individually been very anti-Semitic. In fact, the whole Ashkenazi Khazar fake Jew theory, which holds that there are no true Jews today, was, I believe, popularized to support Roman Catholic supersessionism and the false view that God is forever done dealing with Old Testament Israel as a nation. That Roman Catholic dogma of supersessionism holds that the Catholic Church replaced Israel as the true Israel of God and is, in fact, the kingdom of God on earth. Of course, that's utter nonsense for many reasons. But first and foremost, because the Roman Catholic Church does not express or represent true Christianity, as Jade talked about first hour. The Catholic Church espouses a false gospel of pagan priestly ritual and is itself as much an antichrist house of satanic idolatry as was apostate Israel, while also demanding a top-down authoritarian structure from the Pope to the pew over all Christian churches that is completely unbiblical and, in fact, satanic. And so, as mentioned... A proper view of the relationship between Old Testament Israel and the church, the New Testament church, is inseparably linked to a proper definition of the New Testament church. So I'm going to cover that first. For many centuries, I've covered it before, I'm just going to briefly review. For many centuries, Western civilization was dominated by the extremely oppressive Roman Catholic definition of the church as a worldwide universal church. That term Catholic, of course, meaning universal, 
this being a visible earthly universal church, wherein all local churches were supposed to be subservient to the central authority of the papacy in Rome, with doctrinal and ecclesiastical authority flowing from the top down, from the Pope, the supreme ruler of the church, as Christ's alleged vicar on earth, to the cardinals, to the regional bishops, and then to the local priests that preside over local congregations. As stated, this definition and model of the church is completely unbiblical. It has no basis in the scriptures whatsoever. So where did it come from? Where did this come from? That's a very important question. And to answer it, we need to repeat a little bit of church history that we touched on about four years ago. We see throughout the New Testament that initially, once the doctrine of the apostles had been firmly established in the writings in the New Testament scriptures, all the various churches were at that time independent, autonomous, self-governing, local, visible churches that met together every Lord's Day at a particular place. Sounds a bit like our church, doesn't it? There was never any central authority established to oversee all the churches. Instead, every elder of every Christian church and every member in every church answered to the Lord Jesus directly and were charged together as a church with contending for the faith that was once delivered to the saints, as recorded as that faith was put down in the scriptures. The idea, or I guess I'd say the devil's plan, of the earthly, visible, universal, or Catholic church possibly arose as early as the second century, coming directly out of the doctrine of the Nicolaitans that Jesus said he hates in Revelation 2 and 3. From Catholic writings alleged to have been penned by Ignatius of Antioch in the late 1st century, but later shown to be 3rd century forgeries, it's clear that by at least the 3rd century, and definitely by the 4th, the doctrine of the Nicolaitans had taken a firm hold on Western Christianity and a hierarchical clergy was firmly established in the Roman Catholic priesthood. And except for the Baptistic nonconformists uh, and dissenters who held to the true biblical mandates of Bible authority, believers' baptism, regenerated church membership, which included groups known as the Montanists, Novatians, Donatists, Paulicians, and other Baptistic groups. Except for those groups, Christianity had basically been taken captive, perverted and paganized by Rome, with the help and forceful aid of Roman Emperor Constantine initially. So by the end of the 4th century, the concept of the Catholic Church was firmly entrenched in ecclesiastical writings and practice, and that was declared to be the state church of Rome, including its satanic system of salvation by works, by ritual, via water baptism, even of infants and other sacraments, apart from which, Outside of that so-called universal church, salvation was not available, they said. But through which, through control, through that church, it could induct all citizens of the empire into its fold and control them. Filling the Catholic church as it did with unregenerate pagans and idolaters who had no idea of true salvation or of Christian doctrine. While it also incorporated many of pagan realms idolatrous practices and holidays as its own, including prayer beads, purgatory, worship of the Virgin, etc., etc. To create a truly universal church that pagans would even be comfortable in. And when the, so when the Donatists of North Africa, who were a Baptistic group, uh, began openly criticizing and resisting the authority of the Catholic Church in Rome for its impure, unregenerate membership was their biggest criticism, and they began rebaptizing uh, that church's uh, Catholic former uh, Catholic church's former members as prerequisites to enter their assemblies. Augustine of Hippo, uh, venerated as Saint Augustine by the Catholics, also known as the so-called Great Theologian of the Western Church, meaning the Catholic Church. Augustine of Hippo rose up to confront the Donatists. And he lived from 354 A.D. to 430, from the 4th to 5th centuries. He was a full-blown devotee of the Roman Catholic State Church, about which he wrote a famous treatise called The City of God, that uh, city being the Catholic Church Triumphant. 
uh, ruling as a with a rod of iron over the nations of the earth as the kingdom of God on earth. For which he translated the third century Alexandrian heretic Origen, transla- translated Origen's teaching and spiritualized approach to the Bible into an early form of preterism, seeing the prophesied millennium of Revelation 20 as today's preterists do, being fulfilled in the newly emerging church triumphant that had by that time become married to and integral with the Roman Empire state. And one of Augustine's heralded accomplishments was the Catholic Church's just war doctrine, as expressed in his City of God treatise, which was in fact formulated for the purpose of justifying the Catholic state church's persecution, prosecution, and extermination of Bible-believing nonconformists as heretics, while citing to Paul's writing in Romans 13 that rulers are to be a terror to evil works and that God's given the sword to silver rulers for a reason, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil, Paul says. So Augustine included heresy, as defined by the Catholic Church, in the evil works that the state had to punish with the sword. And however, uh, before advocating open warfare, against the nonconformists, Augustine tried to reconcile the Donatists with Mother Church in seeing the Donatist legitimate criticism of the impure visible church, how the church was filled with unregenerate pagans. That was undeniable. Augustine was forced then to concoct the first theory of a universal spiritual or mystical church, which he said existed alongside the earthly and visible Catholic church. And so this is where the Catholic doctrine of uh, the communion of saints came from, defined by Catholics as the spiritual union of members of the church, living and dead, as all part of a single mystical body, with Christ as a head in which each member contributes to the good of all and shares in the welfare of all, they they teach. Louis Burkhoff, who was a well-known Dutch Reformed Calvinist Protestant theologian of the late 19th century and early 20th centuries, who venerated Augustine just as Calvin, John Calvin did also as well. He sums up Augustine's position by stating that the real unity of saints and therefore of the church is an invisible one. Burkhoff said Augustine's, quote, theological ingenuity had a twofold effect. It not only helped Augustine to neatly sidestep the Donatist criticism, but it was also the source for later ecclesiological error, meaning heretical misdefinition of the, of the church. And so although Augustine did not use the term invisible universal church, he did originate the concept of a invisible Catholic church out of theological necessity to come up with an explanation of why half its membership was unsafe pagans, reprobates. And so then by the middle of the 5th century, there were at least two definitions of the church, the New Testament church. To the Catholic, who held to baptismal regeneration and therefore an unregenerate church membership. The true church of regenerated saints was the, was universal and also invisible. But to the Donatists and other Baptist or Anabaptist groups, such as Paulicians, Waldenses, and others, who demanded and practiced believer's baptism and a pure church membership, and others who demanded and practiced uh, believers' baptism. To them, the true church was defined only as the autonomous, self-governing local church practicing biblical church discipline and other New Testament concepts. When Augustine's attempt to appease the Baptists failed, the Catholic Church began to wage what it called just warfare against them instead putting, we know, millions of them to death over many centuries after subjecting them to the most cruel tortures imaginable, as we've covered in prior messages. Just to remind us uh, once again of some quotes about those early Baptists, German Lutheran church historian uh, Johann Lorenz Mosheim, von Mosheim, who lived from 1693 to 1755, he's quoted as saying, Before the rise of Lutheran Calvin, there lay secreted in almost all the countries of Europe persons who adhered tenaciously to the principles of modern Dutch Baptists. The Presbyterian Edinburgh Encyclopedia, Presbyterian Encyclopedia, states as follows regarding believers' baptism. 
it must have already occurred to our readers or Presbyterians that the Baptists are the same sect of Christians that were formerly described as Anabaptists. Indeed, this, meaning believer's baptism, seems to have been their leading principle from the time of Tertullian to the present time. And Tertullian, of course, was born just 50 years after the death of John the Apostle. Sir Isaac Newton is quoted as having said, the Baptists are the only body of known Christians who have never symbolized with Rome. So the Baptists are not Protestants, okay? Protestants came out of Rome. Baptists never went in there in the first place. The third, so then the third of three main definitions or models of the New Testament church did not emerge until the Protestant Reformation. That being what has become the popular Protestant model of the universal invisible church. After many long centuries of bloody warfare by the Catholic Church against true Christians, along came Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformers, all of whom were former Catholics. Many, like Luther, were Catholic priests who had been steeped and brainwashed in Catholic ideology and beliefs from which they never fully separated. When Luther broke from the Catholic Church, he kept many of his doctrines, including infant baptism, uh, baptismal regeneration, sacerdotalism, maintained the seven sacraments for the Lutheran church. He also naturally dropped others. And that also included Luther's Nicolaitan view of the priesthood and affinity with a centrally organized universal church, which he incorporated into the Lutheran church. His initial desire was just to bring reforms to the Catholic church. That's right. But that didn't work. And so he decided to break from the Roman Catholic church altogether at which time he then denied that the truly universal church uh, that had to exist was strictly external or visible or earthly and visible. That was when Luther, for the first time, taught that the invisible Catholic church went beyond the bounds of the visible Catholic church. You follow me? So on that basis, Luther taught that the Ecclesia Universalis, the universal church, includes all who are saved, whether they are members of the external, visible church or not. And that's the origin of today's universal, invisible church doctrine. And so we see how the initial corruption of the true apostolic New Testament Christian doctrine ecclesiology, first by Catholics, also known as Universalists, and creation of the Roman, uh, Roman Empire State Church, first led to the Catholic invisible church and then finally devolved into what I call the Protestant Catholic model, which is the universal invisible church. It's the Protestant Catholic model, which is a dualistic view of the church. Two types of church, uh, churches existing in tandem with each other. A universal, invisible, mystical, or heavenly church comprised of all redeemed in all ages, uh, existing alongside local visible churches, each of which also the local churches and the Lutheran, Episcopal, and Protestant denominations also all answer to a centralized denominational authority or synod, convention, or diocese like the Catholics did. And of course, even in the pseudo-Baptist, southern, the southern pseudo-Baptist convention, which in some ways is more Catholic than Baptist, adopted that model also. Just as they also adopted the Schofield Reference Bible as their authority soon after its release in the early 1900s. Like the Roman Catholic model, this dualistic Protestant definition of the church has no basis in the scriptures whatsoever. There was no such doctrine until it was loosely conceived by Augustine in the 5th century and then developed and popularized by Luther and the reformers in the 1500s. But all along, the whole time, the Anabaptist groups fought to maintain their pure Bible-based definition of the church existing only as local, visible, autonomous, self-governing assemblies, which we still fight for today. Again, however, as I believe we've shown, the fact is that the doctrine of the universal invisible church has no basis in the Bible whatsoever, but is in fact disproven by the scriptures, as we've shown in the whole series of messages posted online, last of which I, just, I brought recently, last August, in the message titled, One Baptism into One Body. Briefly stated, as expounded in that message, the, the, word, the word church means assembly. The universal church cannot assemble. Universal invisible church, as conceived, is not and cannot be the pillar and ground of the truth that the church is supposed to be. It is instead a hodgepodge of 
heresies and false doctrines where no order or doctrinal authority or unity can ever exist, where instead every man believes and does what is right in his own eyes. The universal invisible church is as conceived cannot discipline its members or hold them accountable to the word of God. Church membership, as described in the, New, in the New Testament, where every member is indispensable and is imparted with spiritual gifts that he is to function within in the church, is not possible in the universal invisible church. The Lord Jesus established one kind of church, not two. His church, the initial church that he personally founded at Jerusalem during his ministry, and the many churches that sprang from it down to this assembly itself, was always intended to be both local meaning gathered into one place at one time and visible. You can go out and you can find it. Right. They are also supposed to be autonomous, self-governing, and independent, answering only to the Lord Jesus Christ as the whole sole head of the church. There is no biblical authority for any centralized power structure over the churches. Amen. Lord Jesus is to be our, the sole head of the church. He's not to be replaced by any pope or centrally ruling vicar or substitute on earth. He is to be our, our only priest, our faithful high priest who intercedes for us directly to the Father as the one and only mediator between God and man, whose law book, the Bible, is to be our sole authority for faith and practice, and therefore whose salvation from sin is accessed and appropriated by faith alone, apart from any works or priestly rituals. Jesus only builds one kind of church, and that is his proper definition. And summarizing, there will be no universal church whatsoever until all Christ redeemed saints are gathered together with Christ at the marriage supper of the Lamb. Then and only then will there be a universal church, but in that day just as it is now, it will not be invisible. There will never be an invisible universal church, period. And so then, that took some time, but I think that to have been most necessary and hopefully enlightening. Back now to the original question. Does Old Testament Israel serve as a type or figure or foreshadowing of the New Testament church? To answer that question, Old Testament Israel most definitely does not prefigure or foreshadow any universal invisible church. For several reasons also that I will review, Old Testament Israel does not serve as a type or figure of the individual Christian, as some have suggested. However, while I'm always hesitant to say anything in the Old Testament is actually a type or figure of something in the New Testament, unless the Bible says it is. Yes. Nonetheless, in many ways, it is very evident from the Scriptures that Old Testament Israel does indeed serve as a type or figure of the local, visible New Testament church. Right. That brings us finally to the 21st chapter of Matthew's Gospel. As mentioned, Brother Jade has covered this a couple times in the past, once a few years back, going through the book of Hebrews, and then again while he's covering the parables of Christ. So this message will be a bit of a review of what Jade brought up back then, upon which I'm going to add some elaboration and expansion. In Matthew 21, shortly after his final triumphal entry into Jerusalem, Lord Jesus was confronted and challenged by the Pharisees as he taught at the temple there, he responded to their challenge of his authority by telling two parables. The first being the parable of two sons, and the second being the parable of the vineyard's caretakers or the husbandmen, both of which he then summarized with this conclusion beginning in verse 42 of Matthew 21, where we read, Jesus saith unto them, Did you never read in the Scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. In fulfillment of that warning, just as the Lord said to the children of Israel in Exodus 19, as they were gathered there at Mount Sinai, he said to them, and ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. He then repeated that in Deuteronomy 14.2. He said, For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord has chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all nations that are upon the earth. That's what God said of ancient Israel. So Peter then likewise, in fulfillment of Christ's warning to the, to the Pharisees, said in 1 Peter 2.9-10, to 
of New Testament Christians as they assembled in their various local churches. 1 Peter 2, 9-10. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. That clearly shows how the New Testament church is very much a fulfillment of what Israel had been called out to be. One of the most important ways in which Old Testament Israel typified or prefigured the local visible New Testament church is that just as Old Testament Israel was for a time, the manifestation of the kingdom of God on earth. So now it is very true that the local visible New Testament church in which Christ reigns as the sole head of his church through the implementation of his holy scriptures, wherever and everywhere such a church exists, is now the exclusive earthly manifestation of the kingdom of God. Amen. Amen. In other words, the law of Christ for his New Testament people is to be implemented only through his local, visible New Testament church. You guys with me? Yep. When did the Lord take the kingdom of God from Israel and give it to the church? I'm going to go ahead and pinpoint that and say that I believe that transfer occurred just a few days after Christ gave that warning. That's a precise point of Christ's crucifixion and death when that heavy veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom. An act that we were told only God could do. Old Testament Israel was at one time the manifestation of the kingdom of God upon the earth through whom God gave his law, through whom that law was to be implemented. In like manner now the church, the local visible New Testament church, assembles together every week is now the sole earthly manifestation of Christ's kingdom on earth through whom Christ's law for his New Testament people are to be implemented. Amen. And if a Christian has a problem with another brother in Christ that he cannot resolve between the two of them, or even after calling witnesses, where does he take that problem to be resolved? To the church. The local visible church, by the way, because no universal invisible church can handle that matter. The Lone Ranger Christian who has no church also has no recourse when a brother sins against him, aside from taking him to law, which we're commanded not to do. That's right. Israel also typified the local New Testament church and how it corporately met with God. God gave Israel his Levitical ordinances for temple worship and for offering sacrifices that pointed forward to Christ. Now that Christ has offered himself as a final sacrifice, he has given a new ordinance for the local church to come together and to celebrate the Lord's Supper to remember together that final sacrifice for sin. That's his, one of his laws for his church. Israel was given divinely inspired psalms for the singing of praises to the Lord at his tabernacle. Three times a year, the Israelites were commanded to make their way to Jerusalem to meet with God, to offer sacrifices, and where they would join in chorus with the Levites to offer corporate praises of thanksgiving. Amen. Today, such corporate worship is done through the local New Testament church. The Lord Jesus also gave his church the ordinance of baptism yep. as an act of obedience done before the church as a statement that he has become a born-again believer in Jesus and is ready to be a participating and accountable member of Christ's church. However, the Lone Ranger Christian who has no church has cut himself off from both the benefits and the duties of Christ's ordinances for his New Testament people. But, the sad fact is that for the most part, except for a few exceptions, Lone Ranger Christian doesn't care. He prefers to believe he's still a part of Christ's universal invisible church body, which doesn't even exist. But he likes to believe it exists anyway, because that's where every man can do what's right in his own eyes. And he's accountable to no one. He can seek his own pleasure. He can do just what he wants to do on the Lord's Day, rather than assemble with the church as we've been commanded to do. And so just as Old Testament Israel was a manifestation of the kingdom of God on earth, that role has now been transferred to Christ's local, visible New Testament churches. Israel typified the church and how it was called out of the world. We've all been called out of the world as well. 
and how it was expected to be holy. We are expected to be holy as well. How it was entrusted with the Word of God and with the Gospel. How it was expected to serve God and how its members were to treat each other. Turn over to Romans chapter 11. So clearly our conclusion is yes. Old Testament Israel most definitely prefigured and typified the New Testament church as that church is properly defined as a local, visible, autonomous assembly. Another way that's true is in how Israel could and did and how a local New Testament church can also apostatize and can be altogether rejected by God. Israel rejected and crucified its Messiah as a nation and was finally destroyed and driven from the land God promised to Abraham. That kind of apostasy is not true of the truly born-again individual Christian who will never utterly turn away from Christ, never turn apostate and lose or surrender his salvation. He will fall into sin. But we are promised, as we're promised in 1 John chapter 3 and elsewhere, the Lord will not let him stay there for long. Instead, he will chasten him and will convict him to bring him to repentance and restoration. And that's one reason the Old Testament Israel is not a type or figure of the individual Christian, as some have suggested. Amen. But that promise is not to be found anywhere. The promise of restoration from apostasy is not to be found anywhere of a local New Testament church. Instead, as the Lord Jesus warned the church at Ephesus to repent and return to its first love, meaning to the Lord Jesus himself, or risk having its lampstand removed, Revelation 2, Paul also warned the church at Rome here in Romans 11. Here in this chapter, Paul is continuing his lament for the current state of national Israel that he began in chapter 9, where he said there in chapter 9 and verse 2, I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were a curse when Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are the Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the service of God and the promises. So he's lamenting here for Israel who had been basically turned aside from they rejected God. In chapter 11 then, Paul uses the figure of a single olive tree to picture the kingdom of God. And he warns the church there at Rome not to be prideful or haughty against Israel for their apostasy because the church at Rome could apostatize in the same way, he says here. He says both to and about the church itself in chapter 11 and verse 17. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou, this is to the church, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, the branches broken off, meaning Israel, Thou, the church at Rome, being a wild olive tree, were grafted in among them, brought into the kingdom of God, and with them partakest of the root and fatness of the olive tree, the kingdom of God. Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. Thou wilt say then, the branches were broken off, that I might be grafted in. Paul says, well, uh, perhaps, because of unbelief they were broken off, and thou standest by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. Amen. For if God spared not the natural branches, Israel, take heed lest he also spare not thee. Yep. He's not talking to individual Christians here. That's right. This is to the church. Behold, therefore, the goodness and severity of God on them which fell severity, but toward thee goodness. If thou continue in his goodness, otherwise thou also shall be cut off. Yep. Yep. Paul says it's not to individual believers, but to the church itself, which can go. The church can go into similar apostasy and idolatry and have its lampstand removed as well. And as we all know, within just a few centuries, that actually certainly did happen to the church at Rome. And we as a church must stand our ground and be vigilant not to allow this church to fall into such apostasy Amen. as to have our lampstand removed either. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 2. And so then our conclusion is that Old Testament Israel does indeed serve as a type or figure of the New Testament church, when that church is properly defined only as the local visible assembly. And so back to this knee-jerk and very ignorant answer my friend got to the question that he posed from his allegedly Baptist pastor, that this doctrine I just laid out, that Old Testament Israel is a type or figure of the church, is strictly an anti-Semitic doctrine. 
Had I been there to, to hear that answer, my, my jaw would have dropped to the floor. And after I picked my jaw back off, off the floor, I probably would have said something like, Are you serious? Uh, are you kidding me? Please explain to me how this doctrine is in any way at all anti-Semitic. But my friend, who is to be commended for doing his best to find a New Testament church within driving distance that he can be a member of, um, this church, in fact, being about an hour's drive each way from his house, didn't take that approach, thankfully, and he's remaining respectful of that pastor while trying to patiently and humbly teach the man (laughs) some sound doctrine. And I commend him for doing that. He's very humble. But as stated, this is the horrible plight of that so many Christians are in these days when the only King James Bible teaching churches they can find are pastored by men who don't study the Bible for themselves. They rely on the simplistic formula of doctrine they got in Bible college that they think qualifies them to pastor a church. And for the most part, they have been brainwashed by the hyper-dispensational heresies found in the study notes of the Schofield Reference Bible, which is precisely where this pastor's canned knee-jerk reaction came from. As I said, well, it's true that there have been many who have held Roman Catholic replacement theology or a Protestant variation thereof, and Protestants have their variation of that doctrine. And some of them have also been very uh, individually very anti-Semitic. But that's a far cry from holding that Old Testament Israel serves as a type or a figure of foreshadowing of the New Testament church. And so that's not really where this pastor's response came from. Instead, it came from C.I. Schofield's concocted, non-biblical, and heretical, hyper-dispensational doctrine. An Old Testament Israel, as it appears is being restored as a nation today, and Christ's church, Israel and Christ's church, for which definition Schofield, of course, adopted the Protestant view, Protestant Catholic view, the universal invisible church, holding that these are two separate, distinct, called out peoples of God with two separate covenants and two separate, distinct destinies. Israel's destiny on the, on the earth and the church is in heaven. This is what Schofield taught. And how any so-called fundamental Baptist could fall for such unbiblical hogwash as this is beyond my ability to understand. I have preached somewhat extensively on the many heresies in the Schofield Reference Bible and on the follies and the absurdities of John Nelson Darby's dispensationalist system that actually did originate with the Vatican's Jesuits, the C.I. Schofield then popularized as a hireling of the World Zionist Organization. And that has been, that Schofield Reference Bible and that whole dispensational system has been one of the principal tools of the devil to inject several dangerous lies and damnable heresies into was accepted by most Baptists today as fundamental, unquestionable dogmas of the Christian faith. One of the main purposes of that project was to promote the radically racist agenda of the World Zionist Organization and the lie that racial Jews, Jews by flesh alone, are God's chosen people today, whether they come to God through the cross of Christ or not. That's a lie. And to that Baptist preacher, for me to say that is anti-Semitic. But the, another goal of that whole project, the Schofield Bible, was also to attack the teachings and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ as being irrelevant for his church, but instead directed to Old Testament Jews who were still under the law. So it attacked the ministry and message of the Lord Jesus in horrible ways. One of the major tenets and demands of Schofieldite dispensationalism is a distinct separation between Israel and the church into two separate peoples of God, two separate destinies and kingdoms. When the Lord Jesus said ever so clearly in John 10, 16, there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Amen. When the Apostle Paul taught so clearly, as we just saw in Romans 11, 15 and following, that Jews and Gentiles will one day be grafted into one olive tree, not two separate trees for two separate peoples. Amen. And when Paul also said as follows in Ephesians chapter 2. Did I tell you to turn to Ephesians chapter 2? I did, didn't I? Yeah. Ephesians 2. Here's what Paul said in Ephesians 2 verse 12 to 16 to the Gentile church in Ephesus. At that time ye were without Christ, 
being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes are far off from Israel are made nigh by the blood of Christ. Amen. For He is our peace who has made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in His flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in Himself of twain one new man. Gentiles in Israel, one church, one new man. So making peace, that He might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. It was never in the mind of God for there to be two separate groups of elect, chosen people of God with two separate destinies. Amen. Never in the mind of God. Nowhere in the New Testament is any such concept taught. You will find that only in C.I. Schofield's heretical footnotes in that Bible. One place you'll find that, and I put a insert in your bulletins there. I hope you got have a bulletin. There's an insert there so you can follow along here. I'm not going to go through that whole thing because I'm cut, I got to cut this short. But one place you'll find that in Schofield's notes is in an obscure note buried in an obscure passage way back in Hosea 2, verse 2. That verse itself says, Plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. Let her therefore put away her whoredoms out of my sight and her adulteries from between her breasts. Hosea is here addressing Israel's apostasy. And so Schofield's note at that verse reads as follows. That Israel is the wife of Jehovah, see verse 16 to 23, now disowned but yet to be restored is the clear teaching of the passages. He then said, this relationship is not to be confounded with that of the church of Christ. He said, in the mystery of the divine triunity, both are true. He said, the New Testament speaks of the church as a virgin espoused to one husband, which, which is Jesus, which could never be said of an adulterous wife, Israel, restored in grace. Israel is then to be the restored and forgiven wife of Jehovah, the church, the virgin wife of the Lamb. Well, guess what? The Lamb is Jehovah. Amen. <laughs> so, Israel, Jehovah's earthly wife, and the, and the church, the Lamb's heavenly bride. Well, sorry, Jesus is Jehovah. All right, and one day they're going to be restored into, to, to be one bride, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Several major problems with this statement. Uh, Schofield is saying here that when Israel is restored, it will still be a separate, distinct nation, elect nation from the church, and that the church and Israel have separate and distinct covenants, separate and distinct along with separate and distinct destinies, one heavenly and the other earthly. And the purpose behind this doctrine is to accommodate unbelieving Jews and allow for them to still have a special relationship to God apart from having faith in Christ. That is the sole basis. This is the sole basis. This note and a few others like it are the sole basis for John Hagee's blasphemous satanic dual covenant heresy that there is a separate covenant for the Jews from the church. And it is in direct opposition to the clear teaching of several New Testament passages beginning as stated with the one that we just read and where Jesus said that there shall be one fold and one shepherd. And Paul's statements in Ephesians 2 and Romans 11 that saved Gentiles will be united with the commonwealth of Israel into one new man and one body, both combined into one olive tree and not two. There is today one group of chosen people, not two. Amen. And therefore, no unbelieving Jew or Gentile today can call himself one of God's chosen people. Now again, to the Schofieldite pseudo-Baptist, that's an that's a anti-Semitic statement. But the correct view is that God now and has always had only one chosen people. His elect have always been in every generation those who he called out of darkness to serve him. In the Old Testament, he called out a special people for his name. He called Abraham, said he'd make of him a great nation. But the promise to Abraham did not end there. He also said that all the nations would be blessed through Abraham's seed. And Paul says very clearly in Galatians, that seed was a reference to the Lord Jesus, who the Samaritans, the Samaritans recognize in John chapter 4 as the Savior of the world. This is not replacement theology or supersessionism. That is not our position. In fact, I repeat as stated before that the ones preaching replacement theology, 
of the Schofieldites, who teach that the church must be taken out of this world and replaced by a Jewish state of Israel, which will then send out 144,000 missionaries during the tribulation to preach a new false gospel of salvation by works. That is replacement theology. And that is abominable heresy. We don't preach replacement theology. Paul is clear that in Romans 11 that God is not through with national Israel. But we also don't preach divided kingdom theology or divided chosen people theology. Neither did Paul. We preach exactly what the Old Testament foretold and what Paul preached, which is expansion theology. Under the new covenant, God expands his kingdom and his covenant people far beyond those that are fleshly descendants of Abraham to include not only Jew, but Gentile as well. As even the Old Testament prophets declared in multiple passages. And so the reason my friend's pastor said that the doctrine I laid out today, that Old Testament Israel is a type or figure of the church is anti-Semitic, is because it obliterates what he and his Schofieldite cronies see as a necessary separation and distinction between Christ, church, and, and Israel. And it also teaches that no unbelieving Jew has any right calling himself one of God's chosen people or has any, any hope whatsoever of any future messianic kingdom. And in my mind, it's far more anti-Semitic for dispensationalists to teach that the Jews have to go through the coming time of great tribulation when the church, as they define it, the non-existent universal invisible church gets to escape that time. And it's also far more anti-Semitic for dual covenant Schofieldite extremists like John Hagee to preach the devil's lie that we don't need to preach the gospel to the Jews because they have their own separate covenant with God. It's therefore far more anti-Semitic to hold to the multiple heresies of the Schofieldite dispensationalism than it is to reject it altogether. There's far more I could say on this topic for now, but I've gone long enough, maybe too long for some. I need to bring the message to a close. So in conclusion, Old Testament Israel does indeed serve as a type or figure of the New Testament church when that church is properly identified and defined as a local visible assembly. But as Paul says in Romans 11, 25 to 26, at the present time, blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Then the next verse says, And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. One day, blinded Israel will be restored. A day is coming, after Paul says, The fullness of the Gentiles have come into the kingdom. And when the Lord Jesus says, The times of the Gentiles be fulfilled, that God will open the eyes of unbelieving Jews that still remain in the land at that time, towards the end of the tribulation, and they will finally see what they have done as a nation in receiving a false Messiah who turned on them and betrayed them after having rejected their true Messiah, having demanded his death on a Roman cross 2,000 years before, who has now come to deliver them from their folly and from all the nations of the earth that will gather together against them. And then will be brought to pass the prophecy of Zechariah. Zechariah 12.8 in that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. He that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David, and the house of David shall be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. It shall come to pass in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. And I'll pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced. They shall mourn for him as one mourneth for his only son, shall be in bitterness for him as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. Lord Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 19, 28, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me, in the regeneration when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, ye shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. In that day, as the Lord Jesus promised, there shall be one fold and one shepherd. And what a glorious day that will be. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, Lord God, we thank you for your word. Help us to understand these truths, even though we didn't express them very well today. I just pray, Lord, that you'd help us to understand your word better and to stand for it as well as we can and to try to get your truths across to those that have today been blinded
by the heresies in the Schofield Reference Bible, been blinded by the Roman Catholic Church, been blinded by Protestantism and his false view of a universal invisible church. Help us to stand for the ancient doctrines of the apostles, to contend earnestly for the faith once delivered to the saints. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Let's sing one day, hymn number 103. We'll do verses 1, 4, and 5. And what a glorious day that will be.